So my name is um, Ariel Barnes. I am an Indo-Black ambassador um, for this calendar year. Um, I was diagnosed with endometriosis at 16. Um, so at this point, about 12, 12 13 years ago, um, and I'm excited um, to be a part of Indo Black. I'm excited to be hosting this um, panel and I'm excited for you guys to have joined us. And I am just gonna go ahead and hop in and get started because we have a lot of stuff that I would like to cover and get opinions on. Um, so we can get started right now. Um, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists. Um, and I'm actually gonna start with um, Janika, right? Janika, I said it right, okay. Um, so Janika Reed is from Fort Worth, Texas. She was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2016, which marked, which marked the beginning of a painful journey that led her to publish her first book titled Scars with an Untold Story. Janika's persistence and advocacy led her to become the first African-American board member of the Endometriosis Association, serving as the director of special projects for women of color and women of color outreach. She has shared her journey through several outlets such as social media, podcasts, webinars, and most recently hosting her first DEI speaker series titled Implicit Bias in Healthcare Endometriosis Awareness. Janika's goal is to continue to raise awareness, provide education, and support for women and young girls affected by this disease. Janika is part of the UNT Health Science Center, and she is the senior program manager there. Hi, Janika. All right, we got Texas in here. Okay. Hot Texas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 101 degrees right now, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, and then uh, I would like to introduce Kristen Jeffers. Kristen is part of, uh, oh, is the founder of the Black Urbanist in Christ Pattern. Uh, Kristen Jeffers, she, did, she identifies as she and they, is proudly Black, queer, feminist, and urbanist, and that's what, she, that's what she shapes her decades long advocacy for spaces that honor Black women and gender expansive people, along with allowing them spaces to thrive. She was one of the first people to bring the concept of Black urbanism to the internet and social media in 2010 by purchasing and launching the Black Urbanist, which in its 12th year continues to be a, a resource for Black urbanism at the intersection of feminism and queer trans life. She is the author of the forthcoming A Black Urbanist Journey to a Queer Feminist Future, a memoir and manifest for Black queer feminist urbanism. She is also the creator of the K. Jeffers Index for Black Queer Feminist Urbanism, a guide, measure, and data center to assess the thrivance of Black queer feminist urbanist people globally and curator of the Black Queer Feminist Urbanist book canon in school. Finally, under the banner of Chris Pattern, she shares her own journey into sustainable fashion and invites others to do the same. A sought after public speaker, workshop leader, and cultural critic. She is the proud and supportive partner of Indo Queer founder Les Henderson. Hey, Kristen. <laughs> hey, hello, everybody. Yes, we are, we are a double threat in this household. Yeah, I see it. I see it. And we love to see it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, Les. Hey, everybody. Les Henderson, who is the founder of Indo Queer, Les identifies as she, her, and they, is the founder of Indo Queer and host of the Be a Beacon podcast. As a Black masculine of center lesbian, her Indo journey has been complicated due to erasure in medical and online spaces. In 2016, she served as a spontane she survived a spontaneous pneumo pneumothorax, a lung collapse that happened due to endometriosis. And once this happened, she knew that she had to get out of there and tell her story and create a space to help others. Her story has been shared by Vice, Cosmo, UK, and she has contributed her experiences to a few medical journals and books. All right, so we're gonna study you. You are being studied left. Okay, you are pushing us forward. Push us forward, we need it. Good evening, everybody.
All right. So I am glad to have you guys here. Um, I'm going to hop right in with the questions. I'm a question girl. All right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to direct some of the questions, but please, everyone, feel free to hop in and give your answers. Um, unmute. And for all of the attendees, um, please uh, start dropping your questions in the chat uh, because I'm going to get to those at the tail end. All right. Um, OK, I'm going to I'm going to throw this one over to Janika. So, Janika, what are some of the measurable goals surrounding health equity? I have to unmute myself. <laughs> um, in my opinion, I think some of the measurable measurable goals is research first and foremost, because there's a lot of research out there for endometriosis, but is it effective? I'm not sure because I'm still new into this. And then being a new board member for Endometriosis Association, of course, they're saying it's a lot of research, but how effective is it for African American women? So that's my goal as a board member to decide you know if there's enough research for that and if and then in my opinion it's also based on race and um of course our background is all measurable goals for health e equity so the first thing when you go to the doctor i believe they always ask you know what are you eating how much do you weigh <laughs> and all that and instead of just trying to test for the actual health issues so in my opinion it's just based on your background research race and all those me measurable goals. Okay. Kristen, Les, do you guys want to hop in on this one? Oh, you muted. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, I pretty much I'm, I echo what Janika says. It's just it's just a continued progress um, that we all have to that we all have to do. We have to continuously get better. We can't just stop because it's Black History Month. We can't just stop because oh now everyone's celebrating Juneteenth. We can't just stop because now more more lower income people have uh, Medicaid or some type of insurance. Some people think they do one thing and they just stop. Kind of like even it's Pride Month. Some people are like, oh, well, we can get married now. You don't need that anymore. But so it's just about con making continuous progress. Right. Continuous progress. I like that. I like that. And not assuming because somebody in somebody's neighborhood and our chain of like medical providers is good on one thing that every branch of it every doctor there is listening and concerned. It's um, you know, I think some of us saw the viral Twitter thread about the issues at NYU Langone. I, Alex is a personal friend, like we've never met in person, but through this internet world, like we've interacted on multiple levels because of our work thinking about how um, Black feminists and Black people live in spaces and places. And yeah, that's just, and of course, I've been with Les in the hospitals, have watching her go through some of these collapses and everything that's gone on with her i've seen it one time i had the panic attack because the doctor was talking crazy to us or talking in a way that's not like you know productive of course i'm trying to work on like yeah there's so many layers and so many things that we're unlearning about ourselves um unlearning our unworthiness and so because i i was at the doctor yesterday i was at the gyn because now i've learned i have issues myself and they're like, yeah, we're not going to pull less in. I'm like, um, she's my care partner. Why would you pull her in? Like, I know that this is supposed to be a routine procedure and everything, but it's good to have two sets of ears. Meanwhile, at where less goes now, we, um, I, I researched because yes, the hospital system doesn't have the greatest record. They come up all the time especially around Henrietta Lacks and people are like, why would you go there? But it's really about e health equity is that it doesn't matter what facility, it doesn't matter where you go. And people have the same, well, maybe not the same experiences if they're bad, but you don't have to get in your car if you have one and drive across the country. You don't have to get on a plane. You don't have to go to multiple doctors. You don't have to go, you don't have to change practice areas. You don't have to come in with like an encyclopedia's worth of, you don't have to know your Latin name of your condition to get service and get well. And yeah, these, these 
it's like on the one hand, people are reading Bodies Not an Apology and they're reading Medical Apartheid and they're doing the work. On the other hand, they're like, well, why would I need to do that? And it's, and unfortunately, that's a attitude that crosses racial lines, it crosses, well, I guess class lines, but I guess, you know, if you're a doctor, you're class privileged. So these are things that I definitely think about with health equity, but definitely thinking about where, where these facilities are, are they decent? Are they accessible? Are they available to people? Do people feel safe there? And are people coming back out of those facilities? Right. Because we're, we're talking about health facilities and yeah, that, that's very real for us that we go in and we don't come back out. So. Right. And, and access, like you, like you were saying, access is like so important. Like that's a huge part of, of equity. And, and, you know, equity is saying that everybody is entitled to it. And everybody gets, you know, like equal care, right? You know, like no matter what your class is or what's going on, you know, everybody is kind of getting the same. And I think access, like you were saying, is like super important. And it's kind of funny because everybody has like similar goals. I hear it. And you guys are like, this is what we're looking for. Like, look, we put it on a poster. This is what we want. <laughs> I care about. I love it. Um, has anyone here seen any positive steps towards bridging the gap in, in health equity? Does anybody know of any any positive things that that are happening in health equity? <laughs> I mean, despite all the horror stories that I've had that's and have, like Kristen mentioned something, you know, the incident yesterday, which I'll probably get into with the, one of the other questions. But I have noticed, especially with it, with endoqueer, that I have had some doctors and medical professionals say, I do want to do better. You know, I want to do better, you know, um, thanks to you, I start you, I put my pronouns and things. So it's it is little steps because after like yesterday when I went with Kristen to the, her OBGYN appointment and it was just like okay the nurse kept promising oh I'll come they'll, they'll bring me back they'll call me back they'll call me back and they never did and then the, then the doctor was also dismissive with her with a COVID test so it, it's not always just something that you can take for granted because not every location not every facility follows it especially traditionally and more um in more pe people of color black brown and where it, we are still coming to terms with these intersections with the lgbtqia plus community with a uh, ability challenge communities. I mean, so it's still a lot of intersections that it's where we're still learning to incorporate. And so we just have to continue to move forward uh, with, to bridge those gaps. But I have noticed some people, you know, some medical professionals are taking better steps. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And I'll say that the last few times I've been to the doctor with less in that particular health system, it's just a lot of folks are struggling with thinking about ability and thinking about incorporating ways of diversity of ability. The elevator was announcing every stop. Um, there's a lot, a large Jewish population. So one of the elevators doesn't operate on the weekends and that is marked. Um, you can get any, uh, there's so many languages. Um, the last time she was hospitalized, she had a menu and she might have missed the dinner hour, but she had a menu and I got the order off the menu too. It's like making me wish I could have my next procedure at this place. But I know if our, it's like, yeah, we're on different plans. And so we kind of side by side seeing the different plans, but my provider is now opening like a pride medical, but it's centrally located, but they are doing that. So there is an effort. They were also at our pride festival and they were in the parade. We saw them because we were just in the parade ourselves. So we saw them, but it's, th those, are the, those are the positives and just um, educating. Um, they're still uh, educating a lot around COVID and integrating things. So that's been positive. I've also, I haven't been to a doctor's office where they're not masking, but then again, we live in the DMV it's at least where we've been and it's there's still hospitals that are shared you have rooms they are being shared but she had a single room you know I was able to have her in and she's my only guest and we're able to do the, take the steps that make you feel comfortable with having a care partner in a room right now so 
yes, there are hospitals, there are medical practices that are doing it right. I'm originally from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, okay. the cones, yeah, yeah. The, the, and if you all, this is something y'all can look up. Um, City Lab, Bloomberg City Lab did a livability study a while back. And Greensboro is number one for Black women, and I'll make the caveat, Black cis women for healthcare. And I think part of it is, is because there's such a wraparound. Like when I was younger, like I was going to the pediatrician regularly. Um, we lived around the corner from the, the county health department, and my mom walked me around the corner, and I got my shots. I, I Honestly, my COVID shots hurt more than having these shots in the leg, but it was it was right there in the neighborhood. And then as I got older, I went to a general practice and pretty much there's like two main general practice areas kind of, it functions like it does with some of the other, like, like a Kaiser type thing, but it's like locally as local based. And honestly, like our hospital system at home decided not to merge with a bigger system. They're like, no, this is going to mess with our equity. They just reopened, um, now, I wish they hadn't called it like a women's center because it doesn't encompass kind of our diversity, like the diversity lesson I encompass. I'm not sure if like sh we went to that wing, we would get the care that we needed, especially if we were um, transitioning or if we were like, you know, yes, I do identify as a non-binary individual. I do lean femme, I'm Southern. Like there's certain things that don't bother me personally. And I, and I like that they're centralizing the care. I mean, I was born in like the, um, this wing that's returned mm -hmm. to the main hospital. So literally like there's only one hospital that you go to, you pretty much go to the same hospital. Um, my mom just went through some major care and they caught it. Like um, they caught her issue immediately. And now she's in remission from that issue because it's just, there's a wrap around care. And so, yeah, there are cities and there are places that, are doing wraparound care and they're doing wraparound care for black bodies and they're empowering black doctors, nurses, everybody at all levels to get the care they need. I've never been in that hospital and I've been there with both sets of parents. I've been there as myself and I've never had issues, but then, yeah, I've been at hospitals with less and it's like, yeah, we gonna yell and scream until we get out of here. So yeah, it that's is, important. Yeah. Yeah, so really, there is it's definitely positive things happening. You know, tele, telehealth, you know, that so many doctors will meet you right here in Zoom or in their portal. So those are the positive things I've been seeing. Okay. Janika, do you see any positive um, changes from, from where you sit? I do sometimes. It just depends on the hospital and the doctors and the healthcare providers that are in, that are in the field. I think there is a slight bridge between and, and gap in those um, issues. It just depends on the person because lately I've had to constantly follow up with my doctors to I get test results, notifying that I have test results, but I'm like, okay, who's calling me to explain what this means? I mean, these words on here, I don't even understand what they are. So I constantly follow up. Who's going to explain to me what that means? So it's just about me following up, staying on top of doctors. Don't be afraid to educate them as well because sometimes they don't know. So I want them to go find the answers for me. So it's just about staying on top of healthcare providers as well. So I do see a slight bridge in that, but hopefully it gets better within the future. I'm sure it will. But being on this platform to me is a step towards bridging that gap. Okay, I agree. People aware of what's going on in the treatment that especially Black women do receive. I agree. Um, you know, I, this is a big one for me. When I was when I was writing out questions, this one actually means a lot to me, and I, I, I'm excited for you guys to weigh, weigh in. What is something that we do knowingly and unknowingly that diminishes our stride to health equity? Um, this this one means this one means a lot to me. Um, you know, as a cis woman, you know, you want to make sure that you're not just moving yourself forward, right? But I'm taking um, everybody with me, right? Like, I, I, I want all of us to move forward. So what are some, you know, what are those things? Because I, I do sometimes feel like unknowingly, right? We, we do things that we don't know are, are kind of pulling people back or diminishing our, our strides towards it. So, so what do you guys think we do knowingly and unknowingly um, to diminish our stride to health equity? Um, what I would say, cause I looked at, I, I, when I saw that I was like, okay, yeah. What I say and the repeated thing I say in a lot of discussions I have is 
unconscious bias. A lot of us, and all of us are guilty of this, we have unconscious bias where we may not consciously realize we're treating someone different. We may just, or we might be like, it's something about this person that's rubbing me the wrong way, or it's something antagonizing about that person. And they might not even realize it, but they'll treat that person different than, let's say, another patient. And especially in the medical world where you're responsible for people's lives and even saving people's lives, lives and giving people the correct diagnosis so they can get the correct treatment to live longer and to be healthier. If they, if you have, if you have that unconscious bias and you're not aware of that, then you're putting people in jeopardy. That's why, so that's why we're having this conversation. That's why Lauren has created this platform in her organization. This is why I've created Indoqueer. This is why Kristen created the Black Urbanist. This is why Jenica is in her field um, because it, we're, if just been so much bias going along around and we're all victims of that so that continues to hold people back in the in the community like what if I like at the appointment yesterday not to keep bringing it up but what if I was if if I did come back there to Kristen's appointment and I could have maybe spoke on something or gave my uh, my input into something that she's been going through but it was a missed opportunity from that specific doctor because of whatever you know was going on with her and then one, and then what I would say as far as strides um, toward, uh, they, but then some people know their bias. Some people just don't care. And they are like, oh, they know they're racist. They know they're, I'm not even going to say homophobic because that means you're afraid, which some people are, but you have people out here, sadly, that are just anti-gay. They're not scared. They're just anti-gay. You got people that are anti-trans. You got people that are anti-black women. You have people that are anti a lot. So when you knowingly know, do that, you're putting people's lives at risk. People are unnecessarily dying because they're not getting the proper treatment because of conscious and unconscious bias. Um, Jan uh, Janika, Kristen, you guys want to weigh in on this one? It's, yes. it's cool to sit out a question if you guys want to sit out a question. It's fine. Yes. In my opinion, we knowingly, well, I say unknowingly, diminish our stride to health equity by not sharing the true death of our pain. Especially when going to the doctor, we kind of diminish like, oh, it's bad, but it's not that bad because we're taught to deal with it. We're taught to uh, just take some medication and you'll be over within a couple of hours just to deal with it. So I think it's just us unknowingly knowing that we're not sharing the death of our pain. We're diminishing that um, stride. And then uh, knowingly, I believe is based on family history. Because when you were young, did your parents talk to you about their health? What are we always told? I don't mm -hmm. want to burden you. Yes. That's the one thing I've always told, even from my mother-in-law, I don't want to burden anybody. So how do we know about our own health when we go to the doctors? You have to check off the box, your health history. I wouldn't know, so I always checked NA or no, because I didn't know about my parents' health. So when I had fibroids, when I had a hysterectomy, I didn't know what none of that was. And then when I told my mom, she said, oh, I had the same thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> it would have been nice to know that. So I want to break that generational cycle because I tell my kids everything, everything that's going on with my body, what I've been through since 2016, they know everything. So I don't want to have that cycle where we're keeping secrets about our health. I even tell my husband, if something's going on, let everybody know in the family so they can be aware of what to check on their box when they go to the doctor. Because mm -hmm. we need to know our family history. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And I let me pop in real quick. So my parents decided to tell me. That's mm -hmm. why I'm able to say, hey, I've got family history of breast cancer. Hey, I've got family history of bipolar because their parents didn't say anything and they're like no we're gonna change the cycle yes I I have the privilege of having watched my mother's hysterectomy on video in 1993 on a VHS yes she just explained she's like yeah so watch the balloon is my uterus and then it's gonna disappear <laughs> they cut out some of it but they're gonna be like yeah here's the balloon and now it's gone and here it is and they actually let her take her um videotape home and this was like a white male doctor cis male doctor and they 
just, but mom had told me that she had had a bad experience with another OB and GYN because she also had endometriosis. So when Les said she had endometriosis, I was like, okay, this is not new to me. This is something that's gone on in my own family, you know, and of course now I've had myself tested just to see what's going on. I just found fibroids. So I'm glad that I had you know, a family that was like, and I had just talked to my mom about this. Now she's still struggling with like me being queer, us being together, like all that. But when it came to health, she was like, okay, you got this going on. They tell you, you can get it, something done about it. Go get something done about it. Meanwhile, like her mother, like we, she never even, my grandmother had never told my mom about her periods. My, mm -hmm. um, and of course, my mom was like, yeah, and we don't even know what's going on with your dad's side. And unfortunately, we tragically lost my dad, not from health reasons, from other reasons. And but he had a lot going on and he probably couldn't tell me all that was going on with my grandmother, even when he was living. So, yeah, it's and then right now me, I'm like, Les will tell you, I'm, I'm like not liking this weight gain. Um, I kind of got shamed a little bit around my weight gain yesterday. Like I have two five centimeters one of them is intramural, the other one is pedunculated, like, of course, and they're on the same side, of course, I'm going to be a little like this, why are you making me feel bad, and then even earlier in this conversation, when I realized that I called something crazy, like, I'm trying to get away from the ableist language, I'm trying to get away from my internalized ableism, from not creating, like, a safe space for folks, and it's so hard, because it's like, you want platforms like this, like this, like, even Zoom, it's like sometimes you have the caption feature, sometimes you don't. Sometimes right. I like to do my live streams for Black Urbanists on like LinkedIn because it automatically does it. Um, I try to be descriptive in my pictures just so that I don't assume that everybody has the same experience. And especially after having read Bodies Not an Apology, I've been trying to like say, okay, love myself and the in the body that I'm in, you know, even if I, you know, be happy that you can get clothing be happy that you have someone supportive and likewise I've had to say the same thing she'll tell you that that like it it was like at first we thought we were just sitting around in the pandemic being safe being careful and just eating our stress away and it was like oh no um some extra things are growing so learning how to be accepting of what's going on radical self-care radical acceptance not blaming ourselves totally educating ourselves, not driving ourselves crazy, not staying in the support groups too long where our heads are just, and then also honoring where we do know things. And I'm, I'm thankful that even though I'm, we're both 30 something and like my, I, I know what's going on and I knew what was going on. And my parents believed that that was important. But of course my grandparents were like that silent greatest generation, you know, grandfather went to world war II, saw stuff. I don't know what went on with my grandmother where she didn't want to share about her periods, but you know, things happen. So yeah, breaking those generational curses, breaking those self curses of not feeling worthy enough because things are happening to you. Right. I'm so glad that you guys were ready for me because that question meant something to me. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad that y'all were ready. <laughs> um, it seems that major corporations, universities, um, and other juggernauts dictate what happens in the health world. How, how do we go up against that? The machine, as you know, some of us like to call it. How do, how do we go up against that? I'll start like my, my day, day, if you want to even call it like, where are we now? We're in so many vor vortexes, but I'm trained as a crisis communicator. I'm trained as a, um, advocate public affairs so I kind of know the language that some of these entities try to write because I've been charged with writing it for other organizations and because I know the language and I know how they talk and I know how they're trying to think as a corporate unit that's where I step in like I help less a lot with some of the language we use in, with endoqueer to say okay hey this is how they they can hear it oh, maybe we need to write a letter because they need the letter um, and needs to go on official letterhead and make, or when we're communicating within our communities and we show up on the social networks. And yeah, I, I especially see it in urban planning and I'm starting to see it in the medical world. It definitely is. When you go to the DEI department, it matters. Um, when I had to report the same folks we just got reported, she's reporting on me. 
because I reported on her behalf, the same entity. And, you know, bless his heart, as we say here in the South, like, I don't think the man meant harm. He just didn't know and he didn't know how to do it. But I'm like, yeah, have a training, have another training, be gentle about it. Give this person an opportunity, like give your staff an opportunity to learn. Um, don't make a show of, oh, well, we have this unaffirming, unknowing person, especially when you're still, your company is still one minute you have a pride float, the next minute you're giving to gun, uh, anti-gun control or some other pharma company that doesn't actually give medicine that's good. You know, I think the one thing that we can do as individual people is continue to build this advocacy, to have these conversations, to educate ourselves and each other and demand to go with people. And yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to see what entities like the ACLU and Planned Parenthood, their legal departments are doing, literally filing injunctions so the, you know you have that institutional battle happening and coming together to make sure that things happen. It's, it's unfortunate so many of our civil rights have had to go through a legal process, but ultimately remembering that, yeah, there's a lot of legal stuff that happens. Yeah, you may be justified in filing a lawsuit, a malpractice lawsuit, or asking an entity to have a, you know, be retrained someone or letting folks know that an entity didn't follow procedure. But I or ourselves, we have to remember we're human beings no matter what. We're worthy no matter what. And don't feel guilty about saying, hey, institution that claims you have a handbook, institution that claims you have law, institution that claims you know everything there is to know about an entity. We're not all hypochondriacs. And yes, there's a little bit of internalized ableism or even external ableism in thinking about that concept. And yes, the, the root of your prescribing and everything is rooted in experimenting specifically on black bodies, black women's bodies, you know, black intersex bodies, like they've had a lot. So yeah, personally, don't give up on yourself. Institutions, let it loose and let folks sit there and educate you. Okay. You, know, you have to keep holding those institutions responsible. And you, we got to hold ourselves responsible too as patients. It's a double edged sword here because. As in, with institutions, we have to continue to build our collective power like we've been doing with these help with the healthcare movements and the health equity movements that we're doing. Because if we don't, they're going to continue to do it. If we're like, oh, that hospital system's too big, nothing's going to happen. I'll just quietly deal with it because they think they have to. But no, we have to keep holding them accountable. We have to keep collaborating and working with those that do want to work with us. And then as patients, don't be afraid to file a complaint. Don't be afraid. And I realize that especially in marginalized communities, sometimes medical lobby, you may have no insurance or you may have a public, a public insurance. So you may only, you, you may, you may only can go to like a public health clinic or your options may be limited, but please know that you still have your rights as a patient and you still can file a complaint. You have to hold these medical professionals accountable for everything. Do not let them continue to get away with it. Um, then there's out there's groups like Lauren's and mine's and Jenica's work and we're all and a lot of us out here we're all here to help we're all here to let you know you're not alone when you have people out here with you that you can collaborate with that you can talk to even with endoqueer so many people are connecting with each other with endo black people are connecting with, with each other so just we have to just keep holding each other accountable okay Janika did, it, did you want to Yes, just to add on to it, I say as the saying goes, if you can't beat them, then join them. So I currently work for a university that's housed in Texas, and we work with a lot of students, and we, I'm on a committee where we're responsible for cre creating these speaker series. And so it was in March, and so I decided to create a speaker series, what we talked about in the intro, that was titled Implicit Bias in Healthcare that focused on endometriosis. And that's where I invited three beautiful ladies to tell about their stories. Even Lauren was a part of that um, speaker series. And it was a great event. We had pharmacists attend. We had all kinds of healthcare providers, students, faculty. So it was a lot of people that 
became to know what endometriosis was. So I decided, hey, just use my platform. If I can do it next year, I'll do it next year, but I'm going to continue to use the platform. So if you can't beat them, just join with them. I like it. I like it. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're, we're battling this from the inside and the exactly. outside. I, I see where we're going with this. I like it. I like it. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> um, I, I want to I wanna pivot to the racial justice part of our conversation today. Um, what does racial justice mean to you? And I'm, I'm very interested because it means something different to everybody, right? So, so what does it mean to you guys? I'll go first. <laughs> racial justice means to me equal opportunities for education, health, treatment, regardless of my physical attribute as a person, being able to get the resources and care I need without knowing my skin colors is the re is the skin color is the reason for me not getting the care that I need that in, in uh, comparison to other women. So it's just about uh, opportunities for research okay. and education for all, not just based on my skin color. Okay. And I'm I'm gonna echo what uh, Jenica <laughs> said, and I'm also going to add. Um, also, we have racial equity means handling our intra, you hear me all intra racial issues, we're still dealing with colorisms, light skin versus dark skin, we're still dealing with a lot of classism. So when it's racial equity, it's not just okay, non black people treating us better, but it's also about us as black people us treating each other better as well because a lot sometimes a lot of times and especially me with my intersections i'll get it not just from racist people but also from homophobic black people or anti-gay you know people of color so it can it just it happens or some people may have a problem because you're not light skin or because you're not dark skin or because you're you live in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood or you're working at this place versus that place so we have to in, in addition to just equality across the board we also have to begin to work we also have to continue to acknowledge and work on our intra issues okay Kristen yeah i'll echo what's been said it's people expect me to not care they expect me to be above it all and i'm like no that's that's not it and it's all of us being able to thrive all of us having that chance to be human and not in the sense where we're not different types of humans where we have all different types of like skin tones places and yeah, systemically, yes, there's certain things like it is in a world where there's all this wealth and abundance that should not be concentrated. There is an injustice and in being on being stolen to this land and then still not being able to reap the benefits. And then people claiming that we have no knowledge, we have no culture, um, we're not. And, and some of that happens in the, the colonial pattern and the enslavement patterns and then the constant being pitted against each other within the African diaspora. And of course, you know, now people saying, well, you know, I'm a white person from Africa. What do you mean? And like right. all, all this stuff where it's like, okay, there is this line. There is this reason why you think that because someone speaks a certain way, looks a certain way, sounds a certain way, even, hey, smells a certain way or goes to a certain place. It goes both ways. It's like, oh, somebody is too bougie or not bougie enough or, you know, they're, whatever their job is. And sometimes we can't always help where we work. We're still overcoming those disparities. Like, you know, Janika's in-house and, you know, being in-house at places you, you encounter so much. So to me, it's that justice of especially thinking about what we're about to honor and like to me it's not a celebration right now it's still honoring and getting to the point where we're at true liberation it's all of us knowing what that liberation is and it is a different answer for everybody but for some folks that liberation stops at what they've been able to achieve what they've been able to do and it's the crabs in the barrel syndrome where they're pushing people back down it's like you can't you can't get up here we're gonna be the only ones that make it but that's not racial justice. It's not solidarity. It's not being in solidarity with other people of color groups, with like um, gender and sexual diverse groups, with ability diverse groups, with 
um, different class groups and thinking about how you treat your employees or you treat people at your job at different levels. You know, one of the things that I, I love about Les is that no matter what, like when we're out, we were just out at a function and we saw, you know, the security team and, you know, she, we've both been on all the different levels, worked all the different levels. And even though we're at a different class level now, it's like, yeah, those people are real. And like, I'm like, I, I never go to restaurants without I'm a, I, she she'll tell you I'm like we got a tip then you know they only really yeah. make the tip wage they out here making two an hour I have to remind her that in the DMV yeah you make it 15 an hour but nowhere else it's right. still 725 in a lot of other places and it's still 213 when you're sitting down in a restaurant and of course right now we're very limited you know both trying to protect our health and energy as well as thinking about other people's health it's like I would hate to be the person um I would hate to cough COVID in somebody's face right now, like knowing that they only make an X amount an hour. And so, yeah, that economic piece is racial justice, certain jobs and our own internalized unpacking of these things. Yes. And, and I do think that that is important in racial justice as well is, is the equity in, in the economics behind it, right? Because there, there is a lot of, um, you know, economics that play into racial justice and people thinking like, okay, these black people up here are cool, but like these ones down here and eh, we're not going to worry about them. And, you know, we have it, like you said, intra, like it's an intra issue that we need to get together too, you know, and, and I, I, um, you know, people who travel, if you've been different places, like, you know, black people up here might live differently than black people that you might meet two hours from here in Southern Virginia. Right. And, and that classism follows people and, and, you know, they will treat them less than. And that in, dealing with those intra issues, I think are, are very important. And I'm glad that you guys mentioned that because that is a racial justice issue. You know, how, how we deal with each other is, is an issue. Um, and what obstacles, because we just talked about this. So we talked about economics kind of standing in the way of racial justice. Um, what do you guys think that we can do, like just us on this call to improve racial justice? In my opinion, I think doing what we're doing now, speaking up. There's so many people speaking up, continue to sharing your journey with people that don't even know what's going on. So I think the platforms that are being used is what's needed because so many people are being heard. I wouldn't imagine in a million years that I'll be public speaking about endometriosis. I never thought I would even have endometriosis, let alone what it is. So using our platforms to speak about it is definitely helping because I've seen a huge change in the way people speak about their health. Okay. Kristen. Yeah. Yes. And then I'm in a position where, of course, I'm a, I'm a one person like, entrepreneurship show less helps me out every once in a while but I do think about and she'll tell you I think about when I brought on I, I managed to bring on like an intern for a hot minute last summer for some of my work and I'm like it matters like you know she's had volunteers for endo queer and I'm like okay what how are we promoting this economic structure are we listening to people like okay, I, I wanna give folks an opportunity to attempt to do something and I'm gonna mentor them. And I know that I can coach them and coach them on the ways of the world as it is versus saying, oh, well, they gotta climb their way up. Cause there's so many people like so much, the expectation is that you gotta climb and claw. So it's like thinking about as we're creating our own entities, businesses, advocacy groups, um, when we're at, church or the mosque or the synagogue or a sangha or whatever your spiritual um, affiliation is if you're um, folks that are interacting with the public schools with the hospital systems um, with just jobs like you know Les and I both also work in urban planning and we, we have this conversation with these urban planners all the time hey this isn't cool. Hey, people can't just roll onto the bus when it's like this. Like there, there's a difference here. And then another thing I've been doing, and that's why it's in my bio now. I like I call it my pandemic project, but it's always been a through line thinking about where our clothing comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely we're celebrating, you know, yeah, Tabitha Brown, who's a, another Carolinian. And it's like, wow, you know, we're people are really trying to put our name on products. They're using our brands. Target has that pledge. 
but where's the stuff still coming from? Like I literally blessed my pants that I was able to find last night. Cause I was like, gosh, I don't know who made this. And I think, especially in the Juneteenth season to think about who else is still under coercive labor arrangements here and abroad for us to be blessed or blessed as it were in the positions that we're in. And so, yeah, I think those of us who are of color um, all across the different advocacy groups from um, Movement for Black Lives, NAACP, and of course our solidarity groups like um, AAJ, the Asian Americans Advocating for Justice, and even Surge, you know, when we do see white so-called allies show up for us. These are the conversations that need to be had around this economic equity because that is where I'm see starting to see fault lines and issues in addition to obviously LGBTQ work. And we might be a little bit further along on that, but definitely the economics and thinking that it's okay to um, discriminate because of income or perceived income and sometimes size. Size is still, we're just now getting out of fat phobia. We're just now getting out of um, ableism. So there's there's definitely ways where we still need to not even challenge some folks on LinkedIn today. You know, it was, the idea was cute about the pronouns being um, paying me, but I'm like, you don't want to draw in energy where they only paying you. Right. Abundance is in this world. So be careful with that. And remember that there are also siblings that are black and queer and we are just as proud this month we, we yeah. saw that y'all and so it's, it's taking those moments and saying hey call in hey this is how it needs to roll yeah um pretty much i echo what both of them uh said and i just want to add that of course we're all human so things will happen but especially in these advocacy spaces is you know we have to continue to try to be drama free because we have to remember the power that we hold. Um, you know, a lot of bickering happens between certain advocacy groups and that diminishes the movement that that takes people away. You know, I'll, I'll see people, especially in a lot of marginalized communities and even in the endometriosis community, like, oh, gosh, you know, I don't know about being a part of this There's so much bickering. And then they they withdraw themselves from a movement that they're needed in and that they should participate in. And we see this across the board with a lot of organizations and advocacy groups. So we have to continue, y'all, especially as a people, we have to continue to keep it tight. We have to continue to just be there for one another, check our conscious and unconscious biases, and just continue to just be drop, try to be drama free and work past all the little petty stuff, because that's not helping anybody. Right. I am just like taken back by all of the knowledge that you guys have. Um, and this was an amazing discussion. And I am so glad that you guys um, took the time to join me today. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you were here with me. <laughs> and I'm grateful. Um, and you know, um, these, these types of discussions, these types of panels, um, these, these move us along so much further, right? Like, you know, years from now, when, when we're looking at these videos and we're like, wow, we actually have accomplished a little bit, you know, since that, you know, four years ago at that panel, and, you know, just always moving the bar, and always just, you know, moving everybody along. And we don't know where this recording will end up, you know, 10 years from now, but, you know, I hope that everybody, um, you know, who, who watches this, um, gets inspired to move us forward and move us further along. It takes somebody with you. It takes somebody with you when you move <laughs> when you move forward. And um, you know, with the legislation that's being presented in Congress in the Senate, I do hope that um, that health equity piece uh, gets closer to equity. <laughs> the same thing with with racial justice. Um, you, you know, I, I'm hoping, guys. So so bookmark this that this is 2022 and hopefully in 2025 we see a little different change and, and even further from that in, in 2030 we see a little bit more right um but, you know because the internet is forever and this this recording will be saved somewhere um so thank you guys for so much for for joining me it means everything to me and just you know shameless plug because i i love to do this 
Um, I'm just going to put you guys' Instagrams on here because I, I, I love to connect everybody. So, um, Janika, I do not see your Instagram on your bio. I don't have Instagram. Okay, this is the thing. I have an Instagram, right? But I only follow celebs. <laughs> But I have a Facebook. <laughs> okay. I don't have my Instagram just popping yet, but okay. Let's. I'm a, I'm a shameless shamelessly plug um, your organization then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. So um, anybody who wants to keep up with Janika, um, you can follow uh, this website endometriosis a s s n dot org to keep up with her work. You can follow Les. Um, at Endoqueer on all platforms. All right. Okay. So that is Instagram and Twitter. Go ahead and follow our girl. And all. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Stay connected. And Kristen, who is the founder of The Black Urbanist and Chris Pattern, you can follow her at The Black Urbanist or Chris Pattern. Um, Indo Black, you guys already know where to find us. Indo Black. Okay, um, and behalf, on behalf of um, Lauren Carnegie, our director, I want to say thank you guys so much. And Indo Black has a few fundraisers coming up, so I'm going to shamelessly plug our stuff in here as well. Um, on June 24th, Indo Black is having a virtual Panda Express community fundraiser. So when you order online, just use code 909091 to support us. Um, and we will also be hosting a meet and greet on August 20th in the PG County, Maryland area. So I hope everybody can attend that. Um, are there any questions in the chat? I haven't seen anything. Um, Ariel, Jessica, thank you guys so much for attending. Um, you know, we appreciate you guys being part of the discussion. And it is 757. So I'm going to let y'all have the rest of your Thursday. Oh, come on. We have another hour. Gosh, that went by so <laughs> right. fast. It did go by fast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Yes, thank nice you. Ladies, thank you so much. You too. Yeah, thank you. And it's, it's, I want to just say it's a pleasure to share the panel stage. It's usually one or the other. We This is the first time we've done it together. So yeah. we'll see that you can book most yes. of your husband and household yes, you can. together. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. See you guys Thank next you. time. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.